Hi everyone. Hi, welcome to Sheffield DocFest. My name's Melanie. I'm a Deputy Director of DocFest and one of the programmers. Uh, and I had the great pleasure uh, of talking to Lydia Lunch uh, here in Sheffield. Uh, well, I was here in Sheffield, Lydia Lunch was in New York, um, live online uh, last night when we presented the UK premiere of uh, Lydia Lunch, The War Is Never Over, which is uh, the film that the trailer you've just watched. Um, yeah, so we were so thrilled to bring uh, that film uh, here to Sheffield. It's also screening still online um, internationally for uh, registered delegates and uh, online in the UK on Sheffield.fest selects um, for everyone. Um, yeah, and that film was very much the jumping off point, um, but we wanted to kind of delve a bit deeper into talking to uh, Lydia about uh, her career. Um, I think the trailer sets things up pretty well, um, and I'm sure if you're here, you know, um, but Lydia's had a 40 year career in all different art forms uh, as a singer, a poet, a spoken word artist, a writer, uh, an actress, uh, and now obviously the star uh, of uh, The War Is Never Over by Beth B. So Lydia will be talking a bit about that, a bit about her very, very varied career. I'm really interested uh, to hear more about what success looks like uh, for such a fiercely anti-commercial artist. And I'm going to leave you in uh, the hands of Kathy Unsworth. Really, really happy to have you here, Kathy. Uh, Kathy is a writer, uh, an editor, um, a former music journalist. Uh, and Kathy's going to be uh, in conversation with Lydia. Uh, so she's going to, uh, yeah, take us through things um, from starting from her uh, career in Norwave through to what Lydia's up to now, uh, current projects. And I can tell you now that, that that's a lot and we'll get a sneak peek uh, into uh, Lydia's current project uh, later. Um, there'll absolutely be uh, time for questions. We'll make sure of it uh, from yourselves, the audience. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave you. I hope you really enjoy uh, what I think is going to be a fascinating conversation between Lydia and Kathy. Um, Lydia and Kathy, thank you so much uh, for doing this on behalf of DocFest. Uh, and everyone, yeah, welcome, enjoy, and don't forget that you can still watch uh, the film online for the next couple of days. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for having me. No, the war is never over and neither am I. But let's start at the beginning, shall we, Kathy? First of all, Kathy and I go yeah. back many decades. And I'm going to do a little reading, which predates even our knowledge of each other, so that people can maybe understand what No Wave was and means to me, because I still consider myself a No Wave artist. And this is a little piece that might help you better understand. And I know, Miss Unsworth, you're always up for a poetry reading. Thank you very much. With no further ado, I'm Lydia Lunch. The war is never over. No wave. Now and then. I hit Manhattan as a teen terror in 1976, inspired by the manic ravings of Lester Bangs in Cream Magazine, the Velvet Underground sarcastic wit, the glamour of the New York Dolls' first album, and the poetic scat of Piss Factory by Patti Smith. I stuck out my bedroom window, jumped on a Greyhound bus, and crash landed in a bigger ghetto than the one I had just escaped from. Of a 200 bucks, and believe me, that was a lot of money back in 76, in my back pocket in a notebook full of misanthropic rantings, sporting a baby face which belied a hustler's instinct and a killer urge to destroy everything that had inspired me, I really didn't give a flying fuck if the Bowery smelt like dog shit, and believe me, it did. I wasn't expecting that the toilets at CBGB's were going to be the bookend to Deschamps' urinals, but then again, maybe... 1977 had more in common with 1917 than anyone would have imagined. New York City during the late 1970s and early 1980s was a beautifully ravaged slag, impoverished and neglected after suffering from decades of abuse and battery. She stunk of sex, drugs, and aerosol paint. Her breath hung heavy, a sweet tubercular, sticky and viscous. She seemed to leak from every pore like a sexy corpse, unable to give up the ghost. A succubus, if you will, with that fed on the new meat and fresh blood, which in turn suckled on her like greedy parasites, alchemizing her putrefaction into a breeding ground of intoxicating fauna. 
a contaminated nursery overrun with toxic belladonna, a deadly nightshade whose blossoms mocked death by embracing a life which defied death, which in turn mocked everything else. Now, long before the family-friendly gentrification and capital gain, criminality, whitewashed New York City of all its kaleidoscopic perversion, in order to make it safe for anyone who could afford the ridiculous rents charged for shoebox-sized apartments, the Lower East Side played crash pads, shooting gallery, and bordello to dozens of art school dropouts, avant-noise musicians, radical poets, no-budget filmmakers, and fly-on-the-wall photographers, who all lived in glorious squalor and Cheap apartments, by the way, my first apartment in New York cost $75, that's right. And cheap <laughs> tenement apartments spinning distance from each other's front window. It was a drug-fueled, I could use some now, I'm so tired, don't worry about that. No holes barred, blood-soaked pornucopia of art terrorists documenting their personal descent into the bowels of an inferno in a city which felt like the lunatics had taken over the asylum. Creativity acts as a rogue virus, spontaneously combustion, splattering the brain matter of its host carriers across a finite terrain for a fleeting moment in time, forever staining the landscape. And if you think about it, hippie radicals who flocked to hate Asbury during the summer of love, seeking revolution before the acid wore off, heavyweight Southern African Americans migrating north, looking for paid work, and ended up singing the blues in Chicago in the 1940s, or when the devil hollered and caught his great balls of fire in Memphis throughout the 1950s, or the scandalous theatrics and outrageous decadence of the Weimar Republic in the 1920s Germany, which fostered both an uprising in prostitution and performance art and made the golden age of Hollywood in the dirty 30s seem almost quaint by comparison. The boisterous orgy that had begun in Andy Warhol's factory in the swinging 60s had become a bloated technicolor corpse, kicked to the curb by the gutter punks and no-wave nihilists of the late 1970s whose uh, idea of a good time was defined by how much noise we could make, how much art we could create, and how much trouble we could cause before the cops arrived to close down the after party. Like the anti-art invasion of Dada and the surrealist pranksters who shadowed them, who had a blast, well, pissing all over everybody's expectation of what art was, No Wave was a collective bowel-cleansing catterall, which spat forth a collection of extreme artists who defied category, despised convention, defiled the audience, refused to compromise, and has consequently influenced and informed pop culture as well as mainstream media ever since. Now, it's only a movement in retrospect. Post Alan Vega's pre-punk two-piece appropriately named Suicide and before pop-punk grunge Sonic Youth, New York City was the devil's dirty litter box. No Wave was the bastard offspring of Taxi Driver, Times Square, the Son of Sam, the blackout of 1977, the dud of the Summer of Love, the hate fuck of Charles Manson, the hell of the Vietnam War, Kent State, the Kennedy assassination, it was a mad collective of death-defiant miscreants desperate to rebel against the apathetic complacency of a zombie nation dumbed down by sitcoms, disco, fast food, and professional wrestling. Yes, we were, and some of us still are, angry, ugly, snotty, and loud. We use music and art as a battering ram, as a form of psychic self-defense against our own naturally violent tendencies, an extreme reaction against everything the 1960s had promised but failed to deliver. A collective mania that shot forth through the night skies of a decade riddled with the aftermath of all the failures and frustrations that had come before it. But beneath the scowls of derision, the antagonism and acrimony, the beautifully hideous harangues and nearly unbearable shrill, that grotesque soundtrack which our lives defined and which defined our lives, we were howling with delight, laughing like lunatics at the brink of the apocalypse, in a madhouse the size of all New York City, Thrilled to be rubbing up against the freaks and outcasts who somehow, for some reason, had all decided to run to Land's End and all at once scream our bloody heads off. Hello, Kathy Unsworth. I'm Lydia Lunch. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Lydia Lunch. You certainly know how to put the psycho into geography, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know me well, and I know you always like a little poetry on a Sunday afternoon. Welcome to my church. There's only one commandment. There are no commandments. Yes, very good. And what I that piece really says to me is how you sort of get right into the landscape of wherever it is that you go and really sort of search, seek out its core, really. And 
with this book that I don't know if everyone has seen, Nick Solsby's book that accompanies the film, it sort of takes you on, on your travels, on a voyage around your work and around the globe and the many places that your work has taken you or you've been sort of summoned to. And it just hear, hearing you say that about New York at the time, it made me think actually the places that you travel to, including London and Berlin and New Orleans and and Los Angeles in particular, a lot of the time when you arrived there, the same that was similar of London, that it was still that Jim Thurwell said still that very much that post-war world, it hadn't quite recovered from the, the shelling it got. So you, you're sort of always coming in to these places that have got sort of open wounds on the surface, but where all these brilliant creative people thrive in these places. So I don't know, do you want to talk about any of those places sort of individually? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to I want to talk about what you nailed, which is kind of the way that some people use a metal detector to search for buried nuggets. I have this kind of geo psychopathy, which has sought out sometimes econ economic reasons, sometimes architectural reasons, sometimes creative reasons. But as a writer who felt mobility and in some way, the road or the plane or the train called to me to move. And, and, and trust me, still every two to four years, which is how often I used to move, I do get an itch. I'm itchy right now as we speak because I've been back in New York longer than I thought I would. And it's been very important uh, to me, the places I've been at the times that I've been there. And it is very important. The same way that you, as a crime writer, are documenting areas nearby you uh, or that you know or that have called to you. So in a sense, I go to places to commit crimes, and you, as a crime writer, write about the crimes that have been committed. <laughs> That's something I got in there, honey bunny. Yeah, but I think that the other thing that connects that is when you go to a crime scene and you look around, you actually, in the surrounding area, you find some really interesting people, and you, like, when you came to London, you were working with the birthday party, Roland Howard. You did work with Annie Hogan, um, Barry Adamson, Thurwell, of course, all those, and some of the Banshees, all those people that were in that that world at that time. And I think it was a really a great cross pollination <laughs> of of people. So some would some yeah. would call it a, a pollution and contamination. <laughs> In fact, but uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, first of all, I, I am a rabid collaborator and also a curator because when I first decided to go to New York, I thought it would be to do spoken word. But it, after after the beats and after Patti Smith rock and roll poetry and before the New Yorkians, the spoken word didn't really exist. So I created Teenage Jesus, but I had to start curating my own spoken word shows, and in a sense that also led to collaborations. And, and, and hence, that leads me to go to other cities to collaborate with people as well. And I've had some, I have to say, I'm quite, I couldn't pick a favorite because I, they're not like children because I don't have any, but all of the projects I have to say have been as successful, successful meaning they lived up to what I expected, what I chose, and again, I have a concept, I choose the collaborators. I never decide I just want to work with a person for the sake of working with that person. So I'm quite happy and, and kind of amazed. Uh, but from a very early age, I knew I had to document everything and, and own it. And I'm amazed yeah. when I hear other people that just don't own their work. Yeah, no, that's really true. I mean, you've been way ahead of your time in all of that respect. and. And, you know, I think that people are only just sort of catching up to the fact that you do have to own all well, you your mean I, right you now. mean, honey, you mean I've only been doing it for about 43 years, longer than most people yeah. have been alive? Hey. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> they're, ju they're, they're just catching up to the Marquis de Sade. What can I say? Born on the same day. I, sometimes it takes 30, sometimes it takes 300 years. Sometimes they never get it. I'm just happy whoever wants it, it's out there for them. And I mean, but it's, I, I have to... No, I just say, but it's interesting how p things link together on your journey through looking at the film and reading the book again. It's almost like 
your life is like a really epic novel and certain people appear on page 10 and then they go away but then they're back again on page 100 and these collaborations and investigations and the way that you push yourself through various different forms of music and theatre and and writing and speaking they sort of they, they form a whole body of work that really connects that investigates really essential subjects to our and, and, and well, thank you and also i'm still in contact or friends with almost everybody from the origins of my working together uh, i mean we've known each other for decades and you know i wish we saw each other more often but we are in touch we do see each other i mean my friends have always been scattered as the collaborators have been too but i mean other than one or two examples uh, mostly when i make a connection because of the way i view the collaborative process uh we just stay in touch yeah yeah and i mean because just for an example of that something i really love the southern gothic thing that you did with roland harrod which started when you did the brilliant sun velvet morning with the lee hazelwood cover but then when you moved to new orleans you did the shotgun wedding project with him and you were really channeling that southern gothic vibe from being there from doing the harry Crease project as well and meeting him and just it, it was like he was then he was back in the story again and you were creating something from stuff that you'd learn in between i suppose well and with roland s howard i mean i went to see the birthday party in new york when the first time they played because i was already a fan of i you never know who knows you anyway and i immediately gravitated toward roland and he's one of the few people that ever asked me to collaborate first and he asked me if i knew some velvet morning which i did and lee hazelwood was not a popular commodity back back then in the early 80s, it became more popular. And I'm like, of course, because I'd already covered Lightning's Girl and I knew who, so he said, I'd like to do some Velvet Morning. And I said, well, then I'm moving to London to work with you. And I just picked up and went. And then yeah. when I went to New Orleans, I mean, that was to me, not only was Roland one of the most beautiful, beautiful vampiric looking, the dead mouth, amazing songwriters. He just, there was no, he had to be in New Orleans doing music with me. So what, however I managed it, I got him down there and we did it. Yeah. Yeah, and I just love that record because to me, every song in there is a story, is a brilliantly crafted, every song could be a little film noir, it could be spun out of that, yeah. Yeah, my life is kind of like a Jim Thompson novel. You were saying before, yeah, it's kind of a five and dime store. It's as if there would be a five and dime store with one book, took up all of the shelves. That would be my life. I loved what you said to me once that, that in, inside you there was this Charles Bukowski with his face pressed to the window looking down on the LA street below, and you could just channel straight into how he felt writing. and. Yeah, but I, I'm going to I'm going to uh, not correct you, but say I felt as if I could see a part of myself on a yeah. certain high street. And it's like a waking dream where that is part of me, not the exact Charles Bukowski, but a very similar type, crusty, beer bellied, drunken man with volumes of writing under his bed, looking out on a rainy high street from above a liquor store or a bodega, sad and lonely. And there is a part of me that identifies and the same way that I feel that this, my body is a hotel where many monsters live, well, which door should we open? And it's the same way that some of us have access to, if we want to call it, you know, past lives, that there is just an access that for some reason as a psychic psychotraumatic and you know very well what i'm saying as somebody who also yeah. investigates you know the the uh, another realm an ethereal element something that is in the blood something that goes beyond this time that speaks to us calls to us and that then we give voice to god yeah. damn i could have no. said it better if i'd written it <laughs> So absolutely, cheers to, too. Cheers, cheers, cheers to us, Miss Unsworth. <laughs> yeah, it's that whole notion of it being in your blood and your predestiny, and you sort of carrying around all your ancestors with you. I find that a really fascinating concept that you go into, Lydia. 
<laughs> well, let's not forget. I'm going to put my. I remember being in the very room you're in right now one time and asking you, "What's in that box on the shelf behind you?" And what did you answer to me, Miss Unsworth? <laughs> it was my grandma's spirit world box. <laughs> Yeah, my grandma was medium and it had her crystal ball in it. And you saw a little ball and floating in there, didn't you? I yeah. did, and you have you have you have quite a collection of vinyl and a bit of tchotchke. And for some reason, and I had been to your to your place, visited, stayed with you, but at that moment, for some reason, a yeah. ball of light emanated from the box, which happened to hold photographs of the spiritualist granny, granny, great granny. Yes. Granny and, and great grandma, they're both in the same picture in one of them, yeah, that you saw, yeah. And the medium <laughs> in the middle. So that's kind of like maybe we're like the medium in the middle and the spirits that we have to channel into our work. But it's just, just such an, an amazing concept that you put into words probably better than I do, Doug. <laughs> well, honey, look, I have opened your third eye. You've admitted as such. I do love that story. Um, Kathy and I first met because as, a, as she was a, as a music journalist, but familiar with my work and we met and kept in contact over the years, but you, was it in Brighton, a spoken in word Brighton. show where you were, <laughs> can you tell the story? It was, well, it was a <laughs> club called Dew Tongues, Billy Chainsaw, our lovely mutual friend <laughs> had to remind me of what it was called because I went down there with him on the train and you started reading and i've never had this experience before but it was like the world started going into black and white and then it just started stretching and stretching and stretching until it was just a little white line and then it pinged into another little blip and then i passed out luckily onto billy he was standing behind me and was you know, and caught me very well but after that, Lydia, my life was just never the same again. He did something to me that day. Well, it's kind of like when preachers on TV whack somebody in the head. I just whacked you with a couple of poetic sentences, and I'm so glad we're still here talking to each other now. Yeah, and let, here, here's to the next three decades of that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, just, to sort of come back to that subject, though, of, of the, the circular nature of your life and art, I, it was also really interesting to me that when you moved to um, Spain and when you lived in Barcelona, you made some really brilliant music there and that your old friend Mark Cunningham, who you knew from early New York days, that he'd moved there too and you did that brilliant record with him, The Ghosts of Spain, when you looked into all the trauma that had gone on in that country, which when you got your Goya head on. So how... Were you, were you surprised to find him there, or was it almost like... It was uh, uh, no, no, I, I, no, no. First of all, I knew Mark, Mark Cunningham was in the band Mars, which was the band that influenced Teenage Jesus. They were the original No Wave band, although that nobody was called No Wave until that term came out of my mouth. But Mars was one of my favorite, and still one of my favorite bands. And I, I had gone to Spain uh, the first time in 1984, I'm not sure if Mark was living there already, but the minute I went there, I knew I was going to move there. And I just knew, okay, I'm moving here eventually, and I did. And Mark Cunningham was already there, and we started to do some performances, and with him playing the trumpet, which previously was a bass player in Mars. And the trumpet really suited uh, the sounds I wanted to make. And we did you know, a number of things besides Ghost of Spain and, and wonderfully in The War Is Never Over, Beth has some of that footage, which I'm so glad has been documented because, you know, it's a very different type of my poetry as well. And, and with the, the trumpet, but I mean, what I, I know what you're getting at because what called me to be again, as I like to call myself, the liver of America, and now I'm the liver of Spain, is Belchite, the town that Franco bombed in 1936, the first time a country ever bombed its own people, was left as the most gloriously collapsed example of man's insanity. And I would just go there in the summer and in the, the winter to photograph it or do videos. And nobody I knew, in, it's between Barcelona and Madrid, and nobody I knew even really went there and in Spain in the constitution is written in amnesia. We don't talk about the civil war. Now, why am I so attracted 
to the Civil War of Spain, I guess for a few reasons. First of all, the history of Span uh, Spanish the Inquisition, their religious perversion, their glorious surrealistic art, Gaudi, Boonwell, Dolly, the way that the people in the here and now were so open and so free, and this was, and Franco still was in power for you know so many years and once he was gone that the freedom that the people embodied the beauty that is made the juxtaposition of so many bizarre elements the architecture all of this and then doing the ghost of spain which spoke using belchite this collapsed destroyed village as a backdrop for all war for every war and the, the war is never over honey i've been talking about it i'm never going to stop but i then i then i was told i was informed that catalonia and that part of spain had actually at many points come in and dominated sicily which is where my grandmother's from which is where the more psychic witchy a lot of witchcraft in those parts of italy and, and so I really felt, okay, and back to speaking about what's in our bloodline, as we both are, in a sense, psychic decoders. If everybody could read the history of their bloodline, we'd all be insane. Some of us have more access. It's like a computer code that some people can decode, others can't. But in everyone's bloodline, no matter what ethnicity, and it is interesting to know what ethnicity, although we're all mongrels, there is all love, all war, all madness. And that's part of where it's like me traveling to different cities in a sense, working with different people. I think that sometimes I'm going into different eras, centuries, decades of my own bloodline and psycho man seen it. Yeah. Trust the witch. Uh, Trust the witch. Yeah. <laughs> Trust the witch. And, that, and that's why I think you've been summoned back to America for the last four years because you had to be there to document the biggest period of insanity of our lifetimes, didn't you? I must say I loved it because I've never hated anything more. It was fantastic. What ass clownery. I mean, the, look, what, what the, 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 most, the best part to me is how it showed the rest of the world what America really is, which is a bunch of hypocrisy, lies. There is no democracy. We are, we are thank you for showing us how to be a colonial nation which colonizes our own people they won't admit anything this really to me was it's what i've been saying all the hypocrisy of the republic of democracy i was just like damn you're doing my work for me all i had to do was quote that idiot right back on my and happy that during the pandemic i had the lydian spin my podcast because i got a chance to rage every week about how stupid it all was oh lord all for free imagine that 99 episodes yeah, that, so far of the Lydian spin all there including I made a dump Trump commercial which is also online for anybody if they want to see it oh yeah, um, yeah I loved it I had, this, I, I'm just I'm just gonna finish the same way I left America when Bush stole the second election and went to Spain which was done with what Franco and fascism I came back here I had to but it started getting unavoidably so so uh, I guess I'm just what do I hear that chase, chase, chase the fascist assholes because well, they are food for thought. Yeah. And you, that was the, probably the biggest manifestation of that, of our lifetime was that him, wasn't it? Of our lifetime. It's happened before. Historically, it's yeah. very common. I mean, the thing that people don't realize is look, it, it, it is always feudal times to me. This is why it's the same as it ever was in so many ways. Yes, there's been progress made, but still it's like we, we still have kings. They're called politicians. You know, it's always been classism. It still is. America is still, it refuses to understand and accept its history of slavery when the slavery has now sophisticated. Because if you're paid $7 an hour, if you're even paid $15 an hour, this is modern slavery. And we're not just enslaving blacks and browns, we're enslaving women and people that couldn't afford an education because the, or the education sucks so bad in this country. So slavery has actually expanded in America. It has not just been reduced or hidden. No, it has expanded. And, and one of the things that people don't realize is how poor this country is, how many homeless people there are. I mean, of course, there's 350 million people. There's a lot of people. But there are so many homeless people who have jobs and live in cars. And this, other than the third world, does not exist in any other part of Europe. I have never no. seen it anywhere. 
No, because there has to be, and there will not be, uh, any kind of shelter for people. And most people in America, especially now, and the, the how dare they, like, not want to give people, the first time we've had a dole, some money, and then say, well, they don't want to go back to work because they're getting $300 a week. Yeah, well, and you don't want to give the them... paychecks. Yeah, you no. don't want to give them a, a commie NHS or anything like that, do you? Eh, yeah. let's change the topic. <laughs> well, Nick, you know, I found in that book a really brilliant comment that our friend Terry Edwards, who you collaborated with many times, I think he succinctly puts why your podcast needed to happen over the like, those hundred episodes. He said, America needs Lydia more than Europe does. She really understands how America works, the intricacies and the depths of that place. And it's a great loss to America that she isn't as accepted over there as she is in Europe. But perhaps well, this it's year's no, work. it's no great, it's no great loss to me, honey. Because all I'm saying is, don't shoot the messenger. Yeah, my my message has not changed. And I get again, and you know, I've said this about myself. I am like a woman on a hill with a bullhorn, maybe with a shotgun and a dog, maybe not. The war is never over because it isn't. It's been the same freaking war. It's a war of those that have the most against all the rest of us, no matter what color you are or what sex you are or what not. It's, it's the rich against everybody else. And it will, I don't see that changing. No, I don't either. And anyway, here you hear you hear you hear you. Another great thing that is said about you in here, Lydia is that you are a great healer yourself and with that in mind the next project that you've been working on that we're going to get a little taste of in a minute is your next documentary film which you do you want to tell us a bit about that yeah right I, i'm not in it but i i am producing it and it's artist depression anxiety and rage and i've interviewed uh, working with jasmine hurst who i've worked with photography and videos before and we've interviewed 35 artists photographers, writers, musicians who are suffering from depression, anxiety, and rage and try to make some sense of it because it seems like more and more every day we hear people, especially pop stars, everybody just about the issues they have with, I don't even like to call it mental health because I think that whether it's childhood trauma, neglect, persecution, uh, otherness, there's so many reasons for people uh, to feel traumatized as children because nobody taught parents how to love and most parents did a pretty shitty job because nobody taught their parents and this is get passed on and on and and as somebody that doesn't set luck my rage I take it to the stage and I get paid I've, I've have you ever seen me mad <laughs> I'm paid for that. I don't have I've never had anxiety and I myself don't have depression but I, because somehow so early on when it, dealing with my trauma and, and seeing that mine was not unique, it was not the worst, and I was going to talk about it, that's before anybody was talking about, for instance, incest, that I really had so many ventricles to release. And now, thank you very much, as a healer, it's like, it's been pretty crushing because sometimes I'll, I've, I've just asked a friend, I have no idea that they suffered from one, two, or all of the above situations. When I ask them, uh, before I ask them to be in this documentary, and I was just astounded because so many people just, you would never know, and they're suffering. And, and I think it's just the story has to be told. And you know, by some statistics, it's 73% of musicians. And again, I don't like to call it just mental health because trauma affects the body. It affects the body as well. I mean, it affects the DNA, childhood trauma. And then again, there is epigenetic, there is bloodline trauma, there is historical madness that sometimes people don't understand why they're suffering. I, I, I'm thinking one person in the documentary had a great life, has rich parents, they love him, he's pretty successful, wants to throw himself out the window some days when he wakes up. And again, this is something that he has not be, been able to fully understand that might just be in his blood or the, the way pollution and nutrition or lack of it has altered one's DNA. And because anybody that suffers anxiety, it is a physical thing. And what's interesting is also it, that in these subjects, especially with anxiety, people are often saying the same thing, thought loops. I'm like, I, it's horrifying to me because I'm like, I don't have time to have a thought loop. I think it once, <laughs> next. <laughs> How do I? 
I can't help anybody with their thought loops. I wish I could. Anyway, I think that we should show the trailer. Yeah. And then we could talk a little bit more. And I'm, I'm going to plug my computer in. So can we roll the trailer, please, for Artist Depression, Anxiety, and Rage by Lydia Lunch and Jasmine Hurst? Thank you. Wow. Say. Right, uh, hopefully I'll uh, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that it's really amazing and really moving, and you have to take a breath after watching that. Actually, I and have to take a breath, and I've seen these numerous times, and it's been very heartbreaking and heartwarming editing thirty-five people's one-hour-long conversation. Uh, this is a trailer. Hopefully, we'll have it in Sheffield next year at the at the festival. It's going to be playing in Switzerland in in the fall. But it, it's been really heartbreaking because again, these are my friends, most of them, and you just don't know the extent to which people suffer. And and as a healer who doesn't suffer from most of those, you know, forms of madness, I, I have my own form of madness. It's, uh, it's, it's very intense. And somebody asked me, you know, well, why are you doing this? I said, because it's not about me. I've done my whole, I've done enough about me. This is about all, this is about almost everyone I know. And it has to be done because it's not just them. Back to what I said when I first started speaking about my own violation as a child, it wasn't just about me. No, exactly. And that it's another thing that is just not taken seriously. Um, me people's mental health issues. I know you said you didn't, that word is not the perfect way of term, but you know, the amount of money that gets spent on research for that as opposed to physical or the, disorders. Or the, facility, or the facilities and also just medicate people, which is, it works for a time yeah. sometimes. Some people have to try five, 10 different drugs before it works. And really some things you just cannot undo. And I do think that therapy is one of the better ways. And, and there are other forms of healing. And it, it's also what separates me, I guess, from a, a lot of my friends because, and hopefully to the deficit, to not, not to the deficit of others is, as a true rebellion against trauma and the universal insanity, uh, I was always my biggest fan and I always just loved and had to protect that part of myself that, that the people that should have didn't. And then I have to take on that job, as you said, to kind of protect and collaborate with other people. So there's my crown full of thorns. You just can't see it. Yes, but I think I do think that what you are a brilliant living example of, you can channel that hurt and that pain in into some form of artistic, creative expression. Then you can start to heal yourself, even though it might take a long time. And when I saw the extended well, art, version of, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, art could be should be the self to the universal wound. When you saw the extended version. Go ahead. Yeah, that lovely little poet, Jack Blair, that you had on there, and he said something that really moved me when he said words to the effect of he thought about ending it all, but somebody stepped in and took his hand. He met the right person who stopped him. Um, and that is another and that was, thing that really... And that was me. That was, yeah. And that was me he was talking about, which is crushing and and heartwarming at the same time. Yeah, no, it's amazing. But I do think that's another thread of your really inspiring story, Lydia, is the amount of people that you have come into contact with and inspired and given hope to. Um, it just well, grows, you. What's grows and grows. <laughs> well, what's interesting is from the outside, people think because I use a negative uh, vernacular because I use because I express myself with such passion and aggression that people think I must be a bitch I must be hateful anybody that knows me even meet me at the merchandise booth for one minute knows that is not the truth that because yeah. they paint their fear on my face or having no other so few aggressive passionate female icons that that what I present is so much against the bigger picture not against the individual, it's to give voice to the individual. And uh, yeah, anybody that knows me, I can't say I'm exactly a soft touch, but 
I'm certainly there to try to heal the wounded to the best I can. Do we need to take some questions? I so prefer yours, but who knows what the audience has to say. Okay. Did you, are you getting any questions? Are you getting any questions there? I've, I've Kathy not got any through. I haven't got any through to me yet. No. Great. So we, we can continue to. We can. Yeah. Yes. I guess we're answering all the questions, uh, I, which I think the documentary, "The War Is Never Over," should answer just about anything what some one person needs to know. Not that it's look. You, you cram forty three years of creation into seventy five minutes. Beth did a pretty damn good job. I'm always like, where's part two? <laughs> yeah. Where's part two? No, she did She did an amazing job, and that must have been brilliant for you to collaborate with her again, because that's another, you know, she at, right at the beginning of when you first went to New York, she was one of the people that you met there, and now the story comes to that point where... She's the yeah. only one that could have handled it and and also understood where I was... Uh, emotionally and artistically coming from because she also comes from a similar place you know as so many of us do and uh yeah i she, I, I had already done the work of doing the work i uh doing the work i've done she's the one that had the hard job in corralling all of this into a coherent document i'm very grateful and i'm i'm very happy that it's being shown in places yeah and she For but she that, obviously we she loved what she was doing because the way she fitted it all together was a masterpiece in itself anyway the way she brought all those multiple threads together into one to one you know and, and that took i mean that took a couple of major re-edits and she's like not right yet not right and then finally she felt that the thread she wanted is the one she made apparent that could connect this multi-layered spider's web all together and by the way, yeah. you know, Kathy, spite, I've been attacked by spiders three times to near death. The last week in my bedroom, first there were two, and I told my good friend there will be three because this is going to be the reversal of the curse. There was a third, and it was on my birthday. And by the way, yours is coming any day, too, because we are. Yes, it is. <laughs> Did you catch the miscreant this time, Lydia? The eight legged oh. fiend? I, you know, I can spot a spider. Now, I think, look, in 1977 or 8, I had that poster done by a guy who was photographing the Banshees a lot. And I had a poster of a giant tarantula on my chest, which I had. Never bit me, they don't bite. I thought the babies came back to roost when I had been bitten in Spain twice and in Belgium. Painful near-death experiences. I don't even get bit by mosquitoes. So when I saw these little buggers around my birthday, all three different spiders, different kinds. I'm like, they're going down. So I had a friend yeah. over on the second spider. I go, what'd you do with it? Because I released it. I said, what? So it can breed and come back. There will be a third. There was a third. Got rid of it. End of story. I could tell if there was a spider on your bookcase right now if I had to. I smell those a mile away. Maybe even 6,000 miles away. <sighs> you know, you can bite me, but you can't kill me. <laughs> I Maybe guess that, I, that, that, that would be my on my tombstone, but there isn't going to be one, so I don't know what to say. <laughs> that was another brilliant picture, the one where you look like you wear a spider creature when you're... That was From a JK, brilliant one. J.K. Potter, an incredible photo montage uh, is uh, from New Orleans, who I met there, who uh, illustrated like Stephen King books and Clive Barker, and he was doing these manipulations before Photoshop. And an amazing, immaculate J.K. Potter, a great collaborator in New Orleans, who also did the picture of me, like, with the octopus hair, which was so yes. beautiful. And a picture yes. of me where my lower body was a human hand. Very creepy. Yes. Kind of like a, cro a cross between myself and the thing from the Adam's yes. family. Yes, <laughs> brilliant. Yes. That was. Oh, I think we've got a, a, we've got a question, Lydia, and I know it's one that you're really going to want to answer. It's. What's your take on cancel culture, Lydia? Well, you know, I canceled most of my audience a long time ago, so it doesn't really affect me. I'm like, I'm going to cancel them before they cancel me. It's ridiculous. Again, I mean, are we? why are we going so far? We are like in a 1950 state of mind with the yeah, Trumpism, yeah. the cancel culture, the complaining about the most petty little infractions against the per, uh, you know personal space. You know, I'm like, ladies, A, grow some balls. 
you know, you got to learn to fight again. You got to kick against the pricks, as Beckett once said. Okay. Um, cancel, you know, I cancel you. Leave me alone. I just think, where are we? Why are we not? We should be exposing more, not, not shutting things down. We, we, I think this is just another way. Like, we can't tell the truth. We're so full of lies. And now we might as well ju shut down anything I don't agree with. Give me a damn break. I cancel you. <laughs> I'm the council culture. I got a few things to say, and I've been saying them for a long time. <laughs> We've got another one, Lydia. Bill asks, I'd like to ask, what do you look for when deploying noise your work, past and present? When, when what? What do you look for when you deploying noise, in, in inverted commas, <laughs> in your work, past and present? How do you feel the noise, Lydia? That's a very good question, you know, especially as someone who actually prefers the naked word unadorned, because as we have seen, it can actually cause people to faint and open their third eye. Uh, very, I mean, the thing is, when I'm collaborating with somebody, I give them complete creative freedom. I do not dictate, I encourage, and I choose them when I know specifically they're going to bring to what I am proposing the perfect orchestra of either madness or song. So, and, and you know, just the breadth of, and the ability of working with the people that I have done to go from something like Southern Blues Gothic or Cypress Grove, you know, the kind of the follow up to Roland S. Howard, and then something yeah. like Stink Fist or with Thurwell, or, you know, or the, then the psycho ambient music that I started creating myself, or working with Weasel Walter, who is like, a precision master, an amalgamation of all the guitarists, including myself I've worked with, who also brings his own battery of noise to it. I just trust, you know, the people, because it comes to me, here's the concept, who's the right person for it? And there is very, there's very little editing in the thought once I hand them the noise, but, and, but there's just encouragement. That's yeah. Good. I love the one thing that Weasel said on the film that I really loved was when he started working with you, he could almost channel those previous guitarists. He could, he knew how to play exactly how. He is quite amazing like that, isn't he, Weasel? Oh, he was the, he's the only one that could go from Bob Quine to Roland S. Howard to myself and beyond and circle around again and come back. Yeah, he's the only person for the job of of retrovirus, which is a retrospective yeah. I've had for a few years. And, uh, and Bandcamp, you know, it's, it's a cover band of my own songs done to a greater ability. And uh, yeah, it's all on Bandcamp. And I'm very happy, I was say, trying to say before that, I'm very happy that the internet exists where, but that my stuff is available. It's like, look, I can't sell it anymore in the sense that I don't want to manufacture crap. I'm glad there's Bandcamp. I'm glad there's YouTube. I'm glad this documentary exists. I'm glad that people can have access. And and also, uh, the New York University, which bought my archives two years ago, are, are, are starting a digital museum. So all of my work is going to be accessible, which I think is so important. Look, it's not that everybody wants it, but whoever wants it might want all of it. Good luck, kids. That's an earful and a half. But that's important to me, the same way that knowing from the very beginning I was going to document everything and I was going to own everything, it was just natural. And I didn't think in 1977 that now in 2021, but I'm very happy I have that foreknowledge and because I just think it's somebody in Romania, somebody in Tasmania, Burma, wherever, whatever they might hear, whatever they come in, whatever point they come in, I'm just very happy, unlike most very rich musicians who complain that their stuff might be out there for free after they made millions of dollars. I never expected to make money doing music. I had to support a lot of that with spoken word, or I'm a juggler, but I'm just happy it exists and people can access it. You know, good luck, kids. Get an earful. Yeah, and I hate that we'll... I hope we'll be getting some more brilliant music from you and the lovely Cypress Grave and 
retrovirus and big sexy noise as well. I wouldn't mind seeing you kicking the devil's ass with those again. <laughs> the well, well, I've got a project with Grid, which is Tim Dahl is in retrovirus and a co-host on the Lydian Spin. I have a project with him and Matt Nelson, which you've heard, which is uh, kind of a New York state of mind from Henry Miller forward. Henry Miller, John Retchie, David Warner Rowitz, myself, with more like psycho ambient out jazz. I have an album that's uh, almost finished. I don't know how, when, or when we're going to release it with Sylvia Black, which is total jazz noir. Every song is like a black and white 1950s murder, Mr. Very forensic. So I, I have music I'm sitting on, and it will, you know, it's coming. Don't worry. There will be more. And I will be in the UK in the fall in a few other cities where the film will be showing as part of the rock and dock. And I think I'll be performing with Mr. Ian White of Big Sexy Noise. It won't be Big Sexy Noise, but, you know, we always like to mix it up. I yeah, think we're yeah. almost out of time. But I think we almost started. Yeah, well, God, it's always so brilliant to have a chat with you. Ah, and where I, where does the time go? <laughs> well, time is one long second that goes on forever. I say it is. And it's our birthday month. I'm very sad that, well, maybe in the fall we will celebrate together as we sometimes do. It's been a pleasure knowing you as long as I have. And thank you for engaging me in this, for me, Sunday morning conversation from the devil's Absolutely. arse. <laughs> as always it's my absolute pleasure and honor to be with you lydia thank you oh thank you i long to be in the back seat performing our comedy routine which one day may be re revealed to the world that's the filthy female comic duo of hc and cocker could be the next phase mm. you never know yeah let's let's work on that okay we will are we out sheffield it's been a pleasure <laughs> Cut us off.